Welcome back to the show that tells you. You are a quantum computer with free will, witnessed as slow electromagnetic waves in your brain. My name is Justin Riddle, and this is episode 16 of the Quantum Consciousness series. In today's episode, I'll introduce you to the slow wave electromagnetic mind, a theory that the brain generates large scale electrical fluctuations that are the best correlate to your thoughts, perceptions, actions, and feelings. By the end of today's episode, we'll ask the question, are electromagnetic fields sufficient to implement quantum computation in your brain? If you like what you hear today, then please like this video, subscribe to this channel, leave a comment below, or for the audio listener, write a review. Join me inside the mystery of numbers. Come and huff a metaphysical loop. See how concepts become objects and then become quantum. Join us for an episode of Quantum Consciousness. Hey there, my name is Justin Riddle. To introduce myself, I got a PhD in psychology at UC Berkeley. And in my time there, I taught a course on quantum consciousness. And I taught this course for seven years. I loved it, I created it, explored a bunch of these topics. And so this YouTube series and podcast is really an exploration of all these different topics and concepts that I've been really fascinated by and sort of breaking them down into different chunks based on uh, particular topics. Now, in my day job, I am a cognitive neuroscientist and I do research on human participants um, where I deliver electric and magnetic brain stimulation to better understand the neural basis of cognition. And that will actually play a role in today's episode. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about the slow wave electromagnetic mind. And in order to talk about this, I will first introduce you to the idea of neural oscillations, which are the generation of electric fields in the brain, and talk about how this might be a viable level to study the human mind, human consciousness. Do we need to reduce down to more fundamental levels, or is there a valid approach at these sort of higher levels of biological phenomena? After that, I will go into what makes these slow wave oscillations particularly interesting, and how this might relate to a bunch of the um, architecture of, of this more micro scale that we've been talking about in the previous episodes. And then I'll end by discussing what it takes to make a quantum computer. And is there any sort of reality to thinking about the slow wave electric fields as being able to perform quantum computations? And what, what would we really need to, to make that a reality? So I'm going to start off by introducing neural oscillations. And neural oscillations are a really interesting topic because the idea is that there's a bunch of neurons and they're firing, they're generating what's called action potentials. And this is sort of an electrical um, voltage change within the neuron. And these happen very quickly. They happen at this very microscopic scale, the scale of individual cells, neurons. Um, but when you have a collective action of a bunch of different neurons activating together or collectively, you can generate these more macroscopic electric fields where the sum total of all these neurons interacting generates these more macroscopic electric fields. And so for a long time, we had this idea that these slow wave electromagnetic fields we're really just sort of steam off the train engine and the neurons are the train and they're chugging along. They're performing all this meaningful computation in the brain, processing information. And then there's this steam coming off of the train engine and that is these electromagnetic fields that are macroscopic. And so for a long time, people just kind of wrote this off, you know, hey, we're not going to study the steam coming off of the train. We want to study the train itself. And so we're just going to ignore these electric fields. Now, what we've learned recently is that, and by recently, I mean like the last 20, 30 years, these macroscopic electric fields in the brain 
seem to serve as a very close correlate to human cognition. So if I were to take some cognitive process, let's say paying attention to something, um, thinking verbally or like processing some verbal language in your brain or storing information in your brain actively over time. There's a bunch of different cognitive processes that um, people study. Some of the closest correlates of those thought processes are neural oscillations. And so what's really fascinating about this is that we have this naive sense of thinking about something. And if you really introspect on what that sense of thinking about something is, it is a very slow process, right? So as I'm listening to words, as I'm thinking about what to do today, or I'm planning some series of actions, or I'm digesting some information, you have ideas pop into your head, you're synthesizing or pushing images together in your, in your brain, in your mind, and this occurs at this sort of slower rate. And so what's really fascinating is if you measure the electrical activity in the brain, you'll see that this slow electrical activity correlates with these thought processes. So as you're thinking through your actions for the day, it's occurring at this very slow rate, the rate at which I am talking right now. The thoughts that are occurring at this slower scale have direct correlates in your brain. And so what gets me really excited and what I have sort of committed uh, my day job to is to studying these low frequency electrical fields in the brain because they seem to be the closest correlate to our cognition and to our minds. So what's the catch? The catch is this problem of epiphenomenalism, which I introduced in a previous episode, where these slower waves, are they just reducible to neural activity? And if you reduce these slow electric fields down to neural activity, then it sort of removes, you know, the novelty or the uniqueness of these slow waves, because now you can just describe them as a bunch of neurons activating, right? And so to sort of salvage this, there's been a lot of research looking at what if we just mess with these electric waves at the slower scale? So there's been a number of studies looking at this and in a lot of my own research, I've been delivering electric and magnetic stimulation um, to, to people's brains, trying to interface with this slow level of electromagnetic fluctuation in the brain. And can we push cognition, right? Can I boost a cognitive process where I found that there's this certain rhythm in the brain linked to some form of cognition, if I enhance that rhythm with brain stimulation, do I therefore enhance that form of cognition? And the short answer is yes, we can do this. There's been a number of studies, my own included, where we're able to enhance or disrupt certain types of cognition based on the frequency that we're targeting. So we're sort of choosing a certain rhythm, a certain pattern, and then we enhance that pattern or we disrupt that pattern, and then we can disrupt or enhance the associated cognition that we found to be correlated with that rhythm. And so all of this to say that there seems to be some sort of like circular interplay. Some people have called this circular causation where, yeah, neural activity will influence these slow electromagnetic waves, and the electromagnetic waves also influence the neural activity, and they're sort of interacting with each other. And so the question becomes, do we always need to go fully reductive, right? And so part of the slow wave electromagnetic mind theory is that we can study the slow macroscopic scales and this is a valid field of study and maybe even the most appropriate type of, of study to understand human cognition. And that by reducing down to lower and lower levels, you might actually be losing information, not necessarily gaining it. So this is a kind of a, an interesting concept, but to, to flesh it out with a couple examples here, you have a brain region it has a big electromagnetic field fluctuation. You say, 
Well, it's actually just reducible to these neurons inside of that brain region. Okay, well, we've, you know, and the argument would be that brain region is, is just an arbitrary construction. You're just drawing a circle around a brain region, and it's not, it's not real. It's just like a construction, um, and so it doesn't have sort of biological validity. But then you dive into the individual neurons, and you say, okay, well, let's apply that same rigor to the neurons. Are the neurons biologically plausible constructs? Well, you know, they have the capacity to store these, these electric charges, so maybe there's some validity there. But you could, by the same argument, deconstruct neurons down into a bunch of synapses on, um, on the outside of the neuron, right? And these are the connections between neurons. So we say, okay, the neuron isn't actually real. It's actually just a collection of these um, lower level cellular constructs or cellular structures or even just made up out of proteins right and so the neuron is epiphenomenal the neuron is just the steam off the protein train so there's a protein train and that's doing all the real work and the neuron is just sort of an epiphenomena it's just sort of floating around and it's not actually real and then the protein you apply the same logic to the protein Let's reduce the protein down to a bunch of atomic forces and a bunch of mo like molecules that it can be decomposed into. And then the protein is just the steam off the molecule train. And the molecule train or the atomic force train is much more fundamental than the, than the, mole or than the protein itself. So let's do away with that, with that higher level. And then we can carry this process out further and further the atomic forces or these molecules are reduced down to some level of more fundamental physics and then even more fundamental physics and then maybe we're in some abstract form of mathematics and so you get this like infinite uh regression into more and more fundamental fields of study maybe at the bottom is some very abstract mathematics where you're studying like the concept of a prime number and so here we are like, what are the prime numbers? How do we even have prime numbers? And it's like, okay, wait a minute. We started off talking about neuroscience and the human brain, and now we're speculating on the nature of prime numbers or what does it mean to have a set of different uh, you know, mathematical principles or how do we then define the axioms at the basis of mathematics? You know, so we're we're suddenly, you know, so far removed from how does the mind get instantiated in the brain that the question then becomes, you know, at what point are we being overly critical of these more higher order biological phenomena? And can we just study brain regions at that level in a meaningful way? Um, and, and, it, and it doesn't invalidate the study of neurons or the study of proteins or the study of uh, atomic forces of, or of mathematics but that there's like true value given in all these different scales of analysis. And so what we really want, and, and this will be the topic of, of the next episode, is some sort of like universal framework that we could understand how all these different fields make sense with each other or how these different scales of biology or of physical reality can then map onto each other in some interesting way. Um, and, and we'll talk about in some future episodes, this notion of like fractal computation or some sort of way to sort of integrate across this hierarchy of all these biological scales. Um, but all that being said, if we accept that neurons are meaningful, why not accept that proteins are meaningful and also brain regions, right? These higher order, slower, more macroscopic scales um, are also seeming to be very valid. And there's a number of studies just practically where if you go and investigate, you know, the electrical activity in a brain region, you'll find that the brain region is actually synthesizing information from the neural level and that there might not even be a single neuron that has the information encoded in the electromagnetic fields of the brain region. So the region itself has information content, the synthesis of these lower levels, and then that information is not present in any single neuron, 
right? So there's like actual information of interest at these lower levels. So what does this mean? Well, the pitch is that your mind is in these big, slow brain networks, right? You might not be reducible down to a bunch of neurons at, at a smaller scale, but there could be higher order, more macro scales where your mind actually resides. And within that domain, it's doing meaningful computations, it's performing meaningful functions. And so this comes to the, the concept of causality. And by causality, it, it basically says like, where can you have something influencing the future? At what scale? What phenomena are we allowing to be causal, to have some sort of influence on reality? And so if you're a reductionist, a pure hardcore reductionist, you would say that the brain doesn't really exist in any sort of meaningful way. It's just more of a linguistic abstraction. We reduce down to the neural level. We reduce down to the protein level. We reduce down to the atomic level. And you have the force of physics at this very fundamental level. This pushes the universe forward. Everything is happening at this very fundamental level. So to even discuss the human mind as this big old brain concoction is just completely preposterous because all of the causal influence is at this super fundamental level. And so your brain, your experience is just a movie. It's just this 3D animation of a fun show that you're watching, but you're not real, your life isn't real, everything's made up, it's all just this construct created by this very complex information processing at this atomic force level. And everything else is just sort of like uh, fluff. It's imagined. It's kind of like built up as abstractions, but it doesn't serve a purpose. Sort of a intermediate level of causal meaning to your life would be what's called weak emergence. And weak emergence is the idea that you can create more macroscopic units. And these bigger units that you're creating do have an influence on their own future, but they're not able to influence downward. So it's kind of like the causal arrows are all flowing up from the microscopic, and maybe they're flowing forward, but they're not flowing downward. And then the final strong version of emergence would say that there are genuine macroscopic entities that then can downwardly influence reality. So what this would mean is that the neuron is able to generate information and generate some push into the future. And that impetus, that creation of momentum at this macro scale actually downwardly influences the protein level, the molecular level, the smaller scales. And so if we then project it up to the level of brain regions or of your mind, the idea would be that brain regions actually have the potential to push information forward, to cause events, and then to cause downward into the molecular and into the neural level. So what this means, and this is really important for like a free will argument, is that if you are this big, slow, electromagnetic fluctuation in your brain, you are not just along for the ride, but you have downward causality. You have some potential to push your neurons forward, to influence your brain, to influence your body, to go from these big, slow, macro thought scale into the more micro, you know, really fast neural activity scale, and your mind is actually making decisions and pushing things forward into the future, which is pretty much the primary tenet of like free will, right? Free will is the idea that you have an influence on your reality. In order for you to have an influence, there must be some sort of downward causation. And we need these big, slow macro systems, which are you, 
able to influence the body. So that really is the main push here. But what I want to like do is elucidate this with like an example, right? So one example, which I really love is this idea of the theta oscillation. And theta is a Greek letter that just refers to a frequency range between roughly four hertz to eight hertz. This is a fluctuation four times per second up to eight times per second, somewhere in this range. And the theta rhythm or the theta oscillation is found all throughout your brain. And interestingly, it's found all throughout your behavior and throughout your perception. And let me just hammer this home to you. So as I'm speaking, my words have a speech envelope around the theta rhythm. So it means that as I'm articulating and giving out information, there tends to be a five, you know, four to eight hertz rhythm that is the, the rhythm at which my sounds are hitting your ear and that I'm articulating them, right? In addition, your eyes are moving around what's called a saccade or a eye movement. Eye movements are occurring in the theta range, roughly four to eight hertz. Even when you're focusing your eye on a fixed point, your eye is sort of twitching around what's called micro saccades, these micro movements. So your eyes are twitching around in the theta rhythm. My words are hitting your, your ears in the theta rhythm. And so all this audio visual information is actually entering into your brain at a very particular rhythm. And one more point about the theta rhythm for auditory, it's, it goes across um, cultures. So across many, many different languages in different cultures around the world, the theta rhythm is the rhythm at which you articulate. And so what, what's kind of mind blowing here is there seems to be this deep evolutionary biological rhythm ingrained into your brain. And this seems to be sort of a fundamental rhythm at which you are operating. And so as you're sitting there listening to me and taking in this visual information, your brain is rhythmically vibrating electrically at this theta rhythm and your brain is synchronizing with the incoming information and then your brain is passing around that information using these traveling electromagnetic waves synchronizing multiple brain regions together so that they're able to to share this information and there's certain structures in the brain, such as the hippocampus, which is really important for long-term memory. This brain region has a really prominent theta rhythm, um, which can be measured across a bunch of different animal species. And so this long-term memory storage region is getting all this visual information and auditory information transmitted to it. All of this is occurring within a very specific um, rhythm, electromagnetic rhythm. And so there's all of this evidence that that naive experience you have of, oh, I'm experiencing reality, um, I'm thinking about the words, that rate at which you're thinking is directly visible in the electrical activity of your brain. And so this should just be really compelling to you that for all these different cognitive processes, we can find rhythms that seem to line up with the rate at which that you're processing that information. Very exciting stuff. So I wanna end today's video, or the final topic of today's video, is to dive into, into what we've been talking about previously, right? So if your brain is a quantum computer, then you need to have sort of these macroscopic, all these different entangled quantum bits together. They evolve into a quantum computation and then they collapse into digital information and they evolve back into this quantum computing phase and then back into the digital computing phase. So there's sort of this rhythmic fluctuation between these two primary states of computation. And so this is a very surface level um, correlation, if you will. But the fact that there's so much push in biology right now, in neuroscience, to view cognition as a rhythmic process, 
where you have sort of a, a rate of, of information integration where periodically there's an update to your perception. This really lines up nicely with a lot of these quantum computational models where you have some sort of rhythmic refresh rate associated with your quantum computation and we're witnessing all these electromagnetic fluctuations in the brain which have sort of a rhythmic processing. So very surface level comparison here, but it's definitely in line or something you would want to see if you had these sort of macro quantum digital phase transitions occurring. So in the Hameroff Penrose model, they attempt to make sense of these low frequency electric fields. And I'll tell you what that is. So they have this idea that there's sort of these beat frequencies where the microtubules and uh, the quantum computation being processed in microtubules is thought to occur in the uh, megahertz range. Megahertz is an order of magnitude faster than kilohertz. Kilohertz is a thousand times per second. And then megahertz is a million times per second. So the quantum computations proposed in microtubules are happening at a million times per second. This is way too fast, right? So here we are talking about your brain, the slow wave electromagnetic field theory. Your mind is happening at like the five hertz range, is happening at this very slow frequency that lines up with the rate of your experience. But all of these uh, quantum computational models, at least by Penrose and Hameroff, propose that the quantum computation is happening so much faster, a million times per second, when we wanna get down to maybe 10 times per second or five times per second. And so they propose that there's like these beats where you'll have like a certain magnitude of a collapse and there's these emergent rhythms that come from this really fast frequency range. Um, so potentially, you know, there's some emergence of these slower frequencies. But to me, that really feels kind of epiphenomenal, right? To Penrose and Hameroff, um, or especially Hameroff, the microtubules are the fundamental unit of consciousness in your brain. And so everything's happening at this much, much faster scale. And so the big slow rhythms, it's more challenging to imagine how this could be having a quantum computational basis when you know, the, the requirement to have quantum computation is quantum coherence. And so you have to prevent the environment from destroying these subtle wave functions within your microtubules, but it's all happening at such a faster scale. Um, so I don't fully buy into this like beat frequency idea where you have these emergent slower waves because it doesn't seem to me to be um, <clears throat> have like a strong enough coherent core to these, these slower rhythms. So then what, what is the alternative? Well, to be honest, I have no clue. But if I were to completely speculate, I would say that we would find in the future or we might find in the future that there are ways in which electromagnetic fields are able to sustain quantum computation. And then the question is, what are the conditions that you could create an electromagnetic basis for a quantum computer? And right now, there are ways to create quantum computers out of um, electric flow. They require superconduction and what's called Josephine junctions. And a Josephine junction is basically an electric wire, but with little gaps built into it. So it's like an energy barrier. But then um, when you have a superconducting circuit, all the electrons coalesce into a single wave function. And there's ways that it can jump across these energy barriers. And then uh, you can basically create these scenarios where um, the, the flow of electricity is going in two different directions simultaneously, and that kind of enters into a superposition. And so your quantum bit is these like superconduction um, electron, superconducting electron flows. And so could we create something like that in the brain? Whew. I mean, right now, we don't really have a way to perform anything close to that, right? So current superconduction requires you to be very, very cold, um, just, you know, individual degrees above absolute zero. 
However, there might be ways using clever geometric tools to create room temperature quantum computers or room temperature quantum bits. Um, of course, it would take a level of like molecular engineering. Maybe we reverse engineer some of how um, these like protein systems are working. So I think right now I don't really see how this would be possible, um, but potentially there's some room there. An alternative which people are working out and thinking about right now is just sort of simplistically providing that electromagnetic fields are themselves capable of supporting consciousness. And I'm like very much on the fence about this, but the idea is that an electromagnetic field could serve as a form of proto-consciousness, a sort of fundamental um, pre-conscious element. And there are some nice properties to electromagnetism which may lend itself to being quantum-like, although this this is not necessarily like that, that strong form of, of quantum computation that I think it would need to be. But the idea is that magnetic fields are fundamentally delocalized, right? And so a magnetic field cannot be reduced to any physical location. It exists as a field by definition. Um, and so the, the, the idea here is that consciousness is this like permeating electromagnetic field. And so the brain's electromagnetic fields are delocalized and this could serve as like a substrate for this big, slow, delocalized mind within our brains as we sort of naively experience our reality. Um, so I think, I think there's a lot of compelling, you know, connections there. Um, however, for me personally, I think that the future models of consciousness will be quantum mechanical in nature, moving beyond digital computation into this quantum computational domain, potentially into further computational domains. But quantum computers leverage this fundamental aspect of reality of, of being inherently quantum computational if you can prevent environmental destruction. And so I think electromagnetism, as currently framed, has a lot of uh, decoherence or destructive forces imposed on it. So I don't know what it would take to create an electromagnetic field that is immune to these environmental disturbances such that it would be able to, to process information more meaningfully. Um, so I don't necessarily have a solution there, but I definitely think that the idea that we need to find something that corresponds with the rate at which we experience consciousness is, is really key. And so the best neural correlate for the human mind are slow wave electromagnetic fields. Could we be measuring sort of a signature of some sort of electromagnetic quantum computer within our brains? and we don't know exactly how this is instantiated. Maybe there's some network, maybe even the microtubules are able to sustain these, these macro superconducting networks. Um, but I mean, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's no evidence for this right now. And then we're able to measure the, the output or the signature of these, of these big macro systems in the electromagnetic fields. So this episode is really a primer into electromagnetism and slow wave electric fields in the brain. I think there's a lot of evidence that human cognition correlates very strongly with electric fields and with slow wave potentials in the brain. However, the connection to quantum computation is much more sketchy and much more speculative and I'm really keen to know if any of you out there have ideas and how this might be connected up. It might just be a matter of time until we're able to see how something so macro and so slow could be implemented in a genuinely quantum computational way, which harnesses that, that additional computational power. Um, but in the next video, I'll be diving further into what do we see in the brain electrically and there's a lot of emerging ideas about how all these different biological scales can process information together 
and at individual scales and then share information up and down within a biological hierarchy. And I think these ideas of biological hierarchy are really important for us understanding the nature of our own minds and linking up to some quantum computational model is sort of the end goal. But working with what we can measure in the here and the now in modern science, we'll be diving into the electrical phenomenon in the body. And then in the episodes past that, we'll be talking about what is the information content being processed in the body? Is it maybe related to this hierarchy within the brain and within the body and using different aspects of the fractal nature of our bodies um, in how and what is being processed. So more on that to come and I'll talk to you again.